It was now early Friday morning. The rooster's dawn call that followed Peter's denial in the residence of the high priest had only just sounded. The spring sun was still low on the horizon and had not yet pierced the mist of the night chill on this day before Passover. Jesus was taken, bound, from the high priest's residence and his harried trial for blasphemy to the political rulers of the land. When Rome occupied Jerusalem and annexed Israel and Judah to the province of Syria, the religious authorities had lost almost all of their independence. High priests were appointed by the occupiers, even their vestments and their sacred vessels were locked up by the Roman authorities between festivals. In such a tightly controlled religious environment, it's no surprise that only minor offences, say the granting of divorces, were still being adjudicated by the religious powers. Jesus had been tried for blasphemy, a capital charge, in order to have the high priest's prophecy fulfilled that it were better if one man die for the people rather than for the whole nation to perish, Jesus needed to be taken to the Roman overlords for a second trial. And so, soon after the rooster's call, Jesus is brought to the Roman prefect's headquarters. Pontius Pilate needs no introduction to John's readers. His name was on the lips of all those who followed the risen Lord Jesus. From the time our epistle reading came to be written, in the second half of the first century of the modern era, Pilate came to be the anchor point in history of the story of Jesus. There are other historical anchor points too. The Roman historian Tacitus and the Jewish Roman historian Josephus also refer to Jesus. But Pilate was preceded throughout the Roman Empire with a reputation as a brutal, bloodthirsty oppressor of rebellions, and he left his name carved in the soft golden sandstone throughout the province over which he ruled so harshly. Pilate is mentioned in our scriptures and our creeds precisely because through his role in the trial of Jesus, we know the story of Jesus to be more than a story. Instead, we know it to be history. If the secular historians of the age attest that Pilate was bloodthirsty and inhumane, then the picture painted of him in our scriptures is probably accurate. When Jesus is told that Pilate had slaughtered a group of Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices, we get an idea of the kind of disrespect for human life and the Jewish faith by the Roman leader. Jesus answered his questioners then, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered in this way? I tell you no. And he warns his hearers, but unless you repent, you too will all perish. Pilate, Jesus tells them, might have power to kill the body, but it is not those who have authority to kill the body who are to be feared. Rather, the one to be feared is the one who has power over the body after death. I will show you whom you should fear, Jesus says. Fear him who, after your body has been killed, has authority to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. Pilate then may be an evil one, but he's not the evil one. He may be a devil, but he's not the devil. I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more, Jesus assured his hearers then. And in this spirit, he faces the third interrogation of this seemingly endless morning. Unlike Annas' house, we do have a fairly good idea of where in present-day Jerusalem the Roman prefect's administrative headquarters, the Praetorium, was located. John uses the Greek transcription of the Latin word in his story. The Antonia fortress was a stone's throw away from the temple precinct. It was there that Pilate's troops were stationed during the principal Jewish festivals in order to ensure that the religious observances would not lead to any uprising. It was the day before the Passover Sabbath, the first day of the Jewish feast of liberation from slavery in Egypt. Traders would still trade until sundown, but there would be no time for the ritual purification of the religious leadership, which is why the leaders hand over Jesus to the Roman soldiers at the gate and themselves remain outside the Praetorium. Jesus was handed over and faced potential religious defilement, whereas the judges themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement 
and to be able to eat the Passover, John writes. In his being handed over, Jesus and any others entering with him into the Praetorium were, as it were, formally cut off the fellowship of those sharing in the Passover, which is why, presumably for John, Jesus had marked the feast a night early. With the early Passover celebration and Judas's departure into the night before the day of Passover, an unstoppable process had been put into motion. Jesus was defiled, cut off from fellowship, so that all might be made clean and restored to fellowship with the Heavenly Father. John tells in this ostensibly simple gesture of handing over a prisoner at the Praetorium door. What was it that would risk their ritual defilement? There are two possibilities. The first is the likely defilement of priests and Levites through contact with a dead person. If we assume that the Praetorium might have served as a place of execution for capital charges for Roman citizens, who had the right to be beheaded rather than crucified or executed in an arena, then the ground might well have been soaked in blood, if not literally, than at least ritually. The second is a lesser, but no less important risk of defilement. At Passover, the residences of observant Jews are cleaned of leaven or yeast. There had been no time to bake bread on the exodus from Egypt, had been no time for the grains of wheat to die, ferment and produce much growth. At the time of the Passover sacrifice then, this symbol of life-giving death, the yeast or ferment, was excluded from the homes. Once a year, all yeast is killed. A symbol of cleansing from everything else that is ritually unclean. In his own teaching, Jesus often spoke of the deadly and the life-giving qualities of the leaven that people took so much care to exclude at Passover. The leaven of the Pharisees killed Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, Jesus tells his followers, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that shall be revealed, Jesus predicts. Whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard. The secret counsels of all will be revealed, just as the leaven is brought into the light from all corners of the home at Passover, and here, on the morning of Good Friday, literally brought into the light. At daybreak, the agitated, Secret conversations about Jesus' death are brought right into the centre of the Roman administration. The deadly leaven of hypocrisy kills. At the same time, the life-giving leaven brings growth. For the leaven of the kingdom of God is also hidden. It is like yeast, Jesus told, that a woman took and hid in measures of flour until it was all leavened. The life-giving leaven of the world the life-giving leaven of the kingdom, Jesus tells, brings immense growth when hidden. It can feed the body and the soul and grow unseen until it is all pervasive. And so when the religious authorities questioned Jesus about his movement and his teaching, it was to ascertain the effect of that leaven on the people, how many people would have been infected with Jesus' teaching, inoculated with his leaven, as it were, and carry within themselves the secret growth of the kingdom of heaven. That leaven was to be feared even more than the bits of stray yeast that might still hide in a beer barrel or a bread basket in the Roman Praetorium. It literally could ferment at any given moment. And so it was safer to hand over Jesus and stay well away from the walls that contained the reminders of death. Whether that might have been the threat of their own deadly leaven of hypocrisy or the potential deaths of the citizens of that cruel empire on the flagstones of the courtyard. Just as it was better to have the fermenting ferment of the kingdom of heaven cleared out at Passover once and forever, it is better that one man die than the whole nation perish, the high priest had prophesied. And so two agendas are being played out here which have one common goal, to get rid of a potential troublemaker who might whip the people into a frenzy make a claim for the vacant throne of Judea, or worse still, for both the earthly throne of Judea and the throne of God. The religious authorities were confident of the latter. Jesus had made a claim for God's throne. He has made himself the son of God, they will later attest. Pilate did not yet share the certainty of the religious judges, 
but he first sought to ascertain himself who Jesus was and why the authorities of his faith wanted him dead. Are you the king of the Jews? He asked him. And instead of answering, Jesus himself begins to interrogate the interrogator. Do you speak this for yourself, he asks, or have others told you? If you expected a rival claimant for the vacant throne, or a rebel, then your security briefings have misled you. If others have told you, open your eyes and examine whether you find any guilt in me. Pilate also answers with a question. Am I a Jew, he retorts, and so reveals his ennui and his intense disinterest. Pilate is neither interested in the Jewish faith, nor does he really understand the significance of Jewish ritual laws. All he is interested in is maintaining the peace of the Roman Empire, Pax Romana, and if necessary, by making an example of any challenger to Rome's authority, or indeed the authority of the servants of Rome. And so it didn't really matter what the temple authorities believed about Jesus' claims to be God. For Pilate, this was about authority, his own authority as a representative of the might of Rome and his delegated authority to the religious courts that managed the day-to-day -day running of Jewish affairs in occupied Judea. I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation has handed you over to me. What have you done? And Jesus reveals that he is a king after all. The king who has worked the leaven of the kingdom of God through his teaching of the people by opening the eyes of the people to hypocrisy and cover-ups and by making known to them God's truth. Pilate does not recognize the king in Jesus. So you are a king, he asks. He may be persuaded that Jesus is no danger to Rome's authority, but he does not understand what kind of a king Jesus might be. And Jesus tells him that his kingdom is a kingdom of truth leading the people into all truth is why jesus entered the world he tells you will know the truth and the truth will set you free jesus had assured those who heard his message and believed in it that truth is inextricably linked to the birth and death of jesus the incarnation and the crucifixion for st john truth is both an essential quality of the word made flesh the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth as it is the reason of why Jesus continually faces rejection by his followers. Though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came into his own, but his own did not receive him. John tells us at the very beginning of his gospel in the great prologue of the incarnation, as he commences the story of Jesus in the world. From the very beginning of that story, then, it is clear that the end point of Jesus' sojourn in the world is to be rejected for speaking the truth. And conversely, that those who believed in him, who accepted him as the Son of God, the King of God's kingdom, and the way to the Father, that those who believed would be reborn by the word of truth and enter eternal life. Pilate cannot see that Jesus is truth incarnate. Jesus speaks of a truth that Pilate does not know, nor is able to recognize. And so he famously asks, truth made flesh, what is truth? Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice, Jesus had told Pilate, who ignores that voice altogether. And rather than wait for an answer, Pilate turned away from his prisoner who is the truth and who is life and prepares to conduct him to a trial that will lead truth to death. The German composer Johann Sebastian Bach reflects on this incongruity in a chorale. By his letting himself be made subject to the one who has authority to kill the body, by his letting himself be imprisoned, Jesus sets all people free. Through your prison, O Son of God, freedom must come to us. And so the Praetorium's judgment seat the place where Jesus will be condemned becomes the throne of mercy and the slavery of God's Son becomes our release from bondage. If you had not gone into slavery, our slavery would have been forever, Bach concludes. And so as we share in listening to our chorale and in the week ahead, I encourage you to reflect with me 
on what the slavery may be from which we need to be set free. What the truth would be that we would need to hear to be released. I encourage you to listen to that truth through the words of Jesus and to recommit yourself to seeking to follow that truth by bringing before him all that stops us from being open to his word of liberation. I invite you to give thanks with me for Jesus the truth and to pray with me that in him we may also find our way and our life. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, your kingdom is not of this world. Your dungeon is the throne of grace. Be with those who are imprisoned for the convenience of the powerful. You were the victim of unbridled injustice. Change the minds and motivations of oppressors and exploit us to your way of peace. To you, Jesus, innocent though condemned, be honour and glory with the Father and the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Oh, my God.